Welcome to another edition of The Best Business Minds, where we interview business leaders and academics that write thought-provoking books. I'm Mark Kramer, a serial entrepreneur who consults with family businesses and entrepreneurs, and currently I'm teaching entrepreneurship at Vinh University in Hanoi, Vietnam. Today, our guest is Ray Edwards, author of Read This or Die, which I love the title. Uh, Ray, welcome. Thank you very much. Honored to be here. Well, it's great to have you here. So, Ray, why don't you tell us a little bit about your professional background? I started out in the radio business as a DJ and a broadcaster at the age of 14 years old and stayed in that business for over 30 years. I uh, became a program director and on-air personality manager, became the person in charge of marketing for the chain I worked for, one of the larger broadcast companies in the radio business. And then I discovered how to write copy that sells in the radio business. And I became a copywriter. I had the privilege of writing for people like Tony Robbins, Jack Canfield, Mark Victor Hansen, other well-known authors, uh, speakers, trainers, and coaches. And that's what I do now. I, I write copy and I teach people how to write their own copy for their own businesses. Anybody with something to say or something to sell. Those are the people I work with and coach on writing copy that persuades. Well, I have to tell you, that's the hardest thing because I try to teach my students how to write concisely and, and to be able to move people. And that is one of the hardest things you can ever teach somebody is how to write good copy. I agree. And, you know, it's interesting because when I started writing copy, I actually had an inferior inferiority complex about writing fiction and poetry and essays, which I'm pretty good at. But I thought copy seems like it's quantifiable. You can track whether it works or not. So that'll be easier. So I'll do that. And as I got deeper into it and got a few more years of experience under my belt, I realized I had chosen one of the more difficult kinds of writing, not only difficult in execution, but also difficult, but formative to one's healthy ego because you have to learn to sub surrender your need to be right with your need to make things happen to get results. And it turned out to be a good thing for me to do in terms of character as well as in terms of income. So let's jump into your book now. Uh, why did you sure. write this book? Well, um, I wrote it because I started out my adult life and had proceeded down the road to success pretty well. And I had a plan for how things were going to go, but life doesn't always turn out the way we planned. I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease at the age of 46. And that derailed everything I thought my life was going to be about in many ways. I thought my life was over. It was a, it was a struggle, um, but I, I've learned some very valuable lessons along the way. And I wrote this book because I sat down with a friend of mine, we were talking about things that had happened, how I had decided to continue running my business as a copywriter, marketing consultant, a teacher, and despite the disease, how I decided I'm going to live fully, regardless of what the disease cost me in terms of dexterity, ability to speak, whatever it may cost. And he said, you know, we should write a book. By that together. He convinced me to write the book, and here we are. Well, I'm glad you did. My father had uh, early onset of this as well. Uh, that was the side effect of a drug he took because he had melanoma cancer. And so we knew uh, that was coming, and uh, he bought him another 17 years, but it didn't work out so well at the end. So I admire that you haven't let it stop you and you can uh, continue to push forward and had written this book, which is uh, excellent. Um, you uh, talk about uh, that you uh, do seminars uh, and that pe uh, people pay according to the book, 3,000 to $10,000. What, what kind of seminars are you doing? They are seminars that are not just about me lecturing for they're two to three days long. Uh, in one case, we did a five day seminar, which was a $10,000 ticket. And it's about writing your own marketing materials, 
your own Bible for your business, your manifesto, your reason for doing what you do and helping people develop their own marketing materials for their own company, their own business, their own nonprofit, or in some cases for fiction writers, helping them express themselves in a way that not only can they write fiction, but they can write the material that caused people to buy their books. So it's a, it's for a variety of people, but it always comes down to persuading others to buy their products or services or ideas. Well, as you can imagine, I get five, 10 books a day and the title read this or die immediately grabbed my attention. And hence why uh, I looked at the book and I thought it was interesting. I thought it was a change of pace from all the leadership management, um, sales, marketing books that I'm typically featuring on here, cybersecurity, AI, whatever, um, because people uh, either themselves are struggling or know people are struggling, and especially with something that's de debilitating like this. And also, you know, when um, it helps you get through a life better realizing that you should be grateful for what you have. So it it checked a lot of boxes for me when I was looking at this book to decide uh, if we should invite you on. You wrote about you and your wife's strong faith. How did finding out at 46, you have Parkinson's, which as I just said, my dad had uh, at 60 as a side effect uh, of a drug. Well, it only affected us in every possible way and put us through every existential crisis I could imagine because we had this strong faith and belief in God. And it was, I didn't know all this at the time, but I mean, it was very Calvinistic reformed theological framework we were living in. And part of that is when you're in that belief system, it's a transactional relationship with God in many ways. If I do these things well, God will reward me by giving me these things as the reward. And I felt at the time, I felt like, God, you let me down on your side of the deal. And then I began to realize that represents an error in thinking. So I had to reexamine my map of reality. So it, it, it forced me into this dilemma of if I'm going to push forward in life, I have to figure out, well, what is it I really do believe and why? Because what we believe affects how we behave. How we behave affects the results we get in our lives. And I needed to dial that in because I was, I knew the future held for me more and more difficulty in getting the results I wanted. And I couldn't afford to have a, an inaccurate map of reality. How long did it take you to change your mindset? Couldn't have been overnight, and it must have been incredibly difficult. <laughs> well, my first answer to that, Mark, is I'm still working on. Um, I think that's truthful. I don't want it to sound evasive, though. Uh, it took it took two to three years to make the major turnaround because. Um, I had in the beginning, I just took the medicine and it was like magic and I didn't have symptoms and nobody knew I had the disease. And those were days it was easy for, easy for me to continue in my self delusion. But as it progressed, it began to be more difficult to control with medication and more difficult to hide from others. I was doing lots of speaking and traveling and um, people would see me at conferences and they would think I was drunk or on drugs. And I was not drunk, but I was definitely on drugs, Parkinson's drugs. But uh, I had to, I had come to a point where, I, because I was living such a, such a public life and my brand is me, I had to let people know what was going on just to, if, if for no other reason, to stop the, the rumor mill from churning. Um, and in so doing, it became part of my daily conversation, whether I wanted to or not. Um, so this, uh, this challenge in many ways has yielded for me the, the, some of the best decisions I've made in my life about my faith, about my business, about my relationships, uh, in every possible way. But what was the process like you went through to 
change your mindset. And as I said, it took two, three years to do. I mean, that's, you know, that's a lot of time every day, lots of hours. Yes, um, it is. And yet uh, something, I mean, and in, in the beginning of this process, I felt like I want to get this dealt with so I can then right. move on with what's important in my life. Yeah. Um, but I realized somewhere along the way, well, this, this, this that I was trying to get out of my way is what's important in my life. Uh, to to quote the Stoic maxim, the obstacle is the way. Uh, as I began to lean into that and realize, okay, I've, I've I adopted this belief that says life does not happen to me; it happens for me. Now I realize that for many of us, we we recognize that as we're mapping meaning onto events that may or may not have any meaning. But I think because we're wired to do that, it's better to take conscious control of that process than to be a passive participant. So I decided to take conscious control of it. And the process, uh, as I explained in the book, I one day I, I had this realization. I've spent all my life, most of it, since I was 14 or 15, learning how to persuade people to do things. As a copywriter and a marketer, I persuade people to buy things ideas, products, or services. And I had a, a framework I used to do that, which I called the pastor framework. It's not about being a preacher. It's about being a shepherd, shepherding people to a good decision. And the pastor framework is, it's an outline for how to write a persuasive message, whether you're writing a talk or a, a sales page or an ad or a book. You can use the framework to persuade people. And I realized I could use that framework on myself. And so I did. I, I Pastor is person, problem, and pain. You have to first recognize the person you're speaking to or writing to, what the problem is you help them solve, and the pain they feel as a result of the problem. And then the A of pastor is to amplify the problem. So it, become, it became a process for me to, to look at my own life and say, well, the pain is I have Parkinson's and it's screwing up my life. And it's causing me this, it's causing me to be uh, less able to do things. It's causing me to, to be less dexterous, to have more trouble speaking, et cetera, et cetera. And I had to amplify the pain. And I dug deeper and decided the pain doesn't really come from the disease or its side effects. The pain comes from the way I process those things and the way I'm living my life. And in part, it comes from my own behavior, because at the time I still was drinking, uh, I still was uh, not taking good care of my health, I still was not taking my finances seriously. I realized I had to stop all that, so I, I wrote myself an ad, a sales message that started with the words "Read this or die." I felt like I was that in that desperate place, and the title, by the way, is. It's a tip of a hat to a friend of mine in the advertising business, a gentleman named Jim Rutz. He's passed away now. But um, he wrote a famous, famous to a small group of people in, in the advertising world, wrote a famous uh, piece of copy for a newsletter about health matters. And the title of one of his newsletters was Read This or Die. And Jim and I met at a seminar years ago. He knew that I admired his work. And he, as I said, he's passed away by, I chose this title. Uh, I was telling this story to my co-author, Jeff Goins, of this book. And Jeff said, read this or die. That's the title of your book. Yeah. And so that's how the title came to be. And uh, those in the marketing and sales copy world will recognize that title. And I've gotten a few emails and comments from folks. But that's the process I use to begin I mean, I had to get leverage on myself to change my own behavior. So I had to look at what's what's going to happen if I don't do the things I know I should do. Eat better, exercise more, get physical and occupational therapy, go see my neurologist regularly, spend time working on the parts of my life that are not working, get it straightened out. And so I just amplified the, the consequences of not solving my life problems and realized, okay, Parkinson's is a problem, but if you don't solve the other crap in your life, pardon my my language, if you don't solve the problems in your life, it's going to get worse, not better. So I feel like regardless of what challenge we face, I mean, look, 
we're all headed for the same end. The, the, the way of all flesh, it, we all end up in the same place. So the question is, what do we do with the time between now and that day? And I think I just got a preview that my day was coming sooner than, sooner than I thought. And so you ended up, you end up appreciating more every day or, oh, yes. you, or I, or I wondered if you found that it really, like in the beginning, it changed your mindset, but you still found that some of the things that you were doing before being impatient or not appreciating certain things that you still kind of sometimes took them for granted. Yes, absolutely. And when I said earlier that I'm still working on it. That's just, just part of being human. I mean, I have days right. when my symptoms are worse and it's difficult for me and I get frustrated and I, I get angry or I get upset or become impatient. Um, the, the, the thing is I've learned over these years is I've shortened the gap. It used to be that I would get upset and stay upset for two weeks. I'd be depressed for a month. Um, now I'm rarely in those what I refer to as unresourceful states for more than a few hours. Sometimes I am, but rarely. It's usually a few minutes. I recognize what's going on. I have a little process. I sit down or step aside and, and put myself through and I just examine the situation and turn my thoughts around. And it's a matter of reframing um, what I'm, what's happening in a different, more useful way. I'm all about utility. So there's a there's a, a quote from a British mathematician who said George Box is his name. He says, "All models are wrong, but some are useful." And I think that's correct. That's that's, that's been my experience in life. When I was 35, I thought I knew everything, and I thought I was absolutely right about everything. And now at 58, I realize I I knew very little. And today. I know a little bit more. Yeah, I think as you get older, you go one of two ways. Either you think you know everything or you realize how little you really do know and you're still learning. That's me, um, the latter. Yeah, same here. Uh, you mentioned developing personal life objectives. Is it best to write your jet objectives out? And how many is a realistic number that can be accomplished or you know, before it becomes just uh, overwhelming and, and you feel... Uh, stress just putting it on paper. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think um, I can't give an absolute number because we're all a little different. We have there's a variability variability on the scale, but I think for me it's like five, three to seven, maybe at a, at a maximum in ten objectives. But even that feels like too much for me. I uh, at the time I wrote the book, I had seven objectives. Today. I have five and next year I plan to only be working focused on three because I, I have this feeling that, you know, when we say to ourselves or to other people, I have too much to do. That's a sign that we are incompetent at managing our own life. And I'm not, I'm not saddling anybody with any judgment for that. I'm just saying what I recognize to be true for myself. When I say I have too much to do, the way I word the question is the telltale sign. I've put the responsibility for how much I have to do off to someone else. I'm a passive recipient of somebody else's or some other force that's given me all these things to do. I have too much to do. Mistakes were made. Passive language, the ultimate escape route. So I think it's more accurate to say I'm doing too much. That implies I have agency to choose what I do and what I don't do. And I think the answer to the problem of doing too much is, ta-da, do less. Um, and that's a choice. Most people will fight me on that, but it's you don't have to do anything. You don't have to work. You don't have to get a paycheck. You don't have to pay your mortgage. You don't have to pay taxes. Now, there are consequences for not doing those things. But you have the choice, always. I have the choice. So I think the, the real exercise and work for me is making the choice to do fewer things and do the things I do extraordinarily well with full focus and conscious presence. Put down my cell phone every once in a while 
and go outside because the graphics are amazing. Uh, you quote, uh, you quote Alex uh, Hormozzi. Is that how you pronounce his name? Yes. Uh, that when making an irresistible offer, you need to approach the problem not logically, but psychologically. Well, what does yeah. that mean when selling ourselves on making personal changes? Well, it means the same thing it means when we're buying a new TV or watch or a new corporate jet. It means recognizing we make decisions emotionally first, and then we rationalize why we made the decision. We like to tell ourselves a story that we, we've reasoned it all out and that's why we decided to do it. But there's some interesting brain research where people have had the, the connection between the hemispheres of the brain severed through accident or through a genetic um, phenomena that they've, they've been able to use functional MRIs to watch when people have initiated an action versus when they have a thought about the action. Based on the areas of the brain that light up, they can tell they, being the people who've conducted these studies, uh, they can tell that the, the action came first, the, dis, the, the description of why the action happened came second. And some of the most interesting tests were ones where people would um, get up and close a window because they were given a suggestion to close the window. They only processed visually through one side of their brain. So they're unaware they had gotten that instruction, but they explained it by saying, well, it felt cold in here. This is fascinating research. Um, so what we learned from that and through other observation and theory, and I believe it's, there's enough confirmation for me to believe this is fairly accurate. We rationalize our decisions later when, when it's buying something or when it's life change and think about the word rationalize rational, lies. We, we have a narrative. I was watching one of your latest interviews and uh, the gentleman you're interviewing, I can't recall his name, but he said, um, you asked him about his professional life and he made the comment that, well, my professional life, I've had a narrative about what it was over time, but the truth is that's not true. The truth is it's just been kind of a random walk from one thing to the next. I thought, man, that guy, is totally self-aware, not totally. Let me, let me withdraw that sensationalist uh, adjective. He's very self-aware because that's what we do to ourselves. We, we give ourselves a narrative about what our, what our life means and has meant. And this is something that I talk about in the book extensively. The story of your life is not your life. It's just a story. And if you don't like it or it's not serving you well, you can change it. You mentioned that uh, we have to have a belief system and how how do you know if you have the right one to put you on track for future happiness and success, whichever way you define it? Huh. <laughs> oh, that's, that is the question, my friend. Um, I don't, I don't know a hundred percent, but I know with more accuracy than ever, that I'm more on the right track. And I think there's, I think about the scientific method. Uh, we make an observation, we form a hypothesis about what we've observed, what it means, why it happens. We test it, we have a theory, we test it, it's repeatable. We have other people who, who can repeat the experiment. And I think when we're, when we're being self aware that we're not, we don't have a totally accurate picture of the world. We're trying to refine it over time by taking in new data and examining what that means and getting more and more accurate. And how do we know we're accurate? If our goal is to be happy, here's how you know if you're accurate in your belief system. You're happier over time because we can be happy doing idiotic things. We can be happy drinking too much or taking too many pharmaceuticals. We're happy yeah. temporarily, blissful. We end up in a mess. We end up dead because we had an inaccurate model. So my, my goal is not to be right. My goal is to be more and more accurate and in a way that's not harmful to me or others. And I think, you know, eventually I'll exit, exit this plane of existence and whatever is next, I'm interested to, to take a look at and find out more about that. But 
it's it's a continuous refinement process in my humble, but as far as I can tell, accurate opinion. Uh, looking back, did you think you were too hard on yourself? You're human with all the failings everyone else has. Um, I I think I've probably have been too hard on myself in the past because um, I somehow at an early age, I adopted the value that absolute truth is important. And I must always be absolutely truthful and absolutely honest in my evaluation of whatever phase of life I'm in, whatever thing, situations I'm facing, and in my interactions with other people. As I got older, I began to realize it's hard to do that. Because uh, as Richard Feynman famously said, you are the easiest person for you to fool. Uh, and that is, that's, that's the paraphrase. I slightly altered his words there. Um, but the point is, I'm continuously examining my beliefs and asking myself, is this still accurate? The, the, the challenge for all of us is we're willing to challenge our beliefs, except for the ones we really believe. The ones we really believe are we're just we don't we don't call them beliefs we call them facts. Why did it take a why did it take a calamity to wake you up and aren't the vast majority like you were? I think we all have at any moment the agency to change our lives to make a shift in our beliefs. And I think that change can come in many times, in many ways, instantaneously. But for most people, they are just comfortable enough to not be uncomfortable with the discomfort they do have or will have later in life. It's why we don't eat. It's why we don't eat the things we should. We eat the things we shouldn't. We the, the reality of eating chocolate cake every day is it tastes good in the moment, and the great taste outweighs how real the consequences of eating chocolate cake every day are to us in our minds. If we could get focused on the future results of our present behavior, we behave differently. So in other words, it doesn't require calamity, calamity to change, but unfortunately, most people have no other motivation to make the change until the disaster occurs. They have to have the divorce or the breakup or, or the tragedy happen before they're willing to, to examine their life and change the way they've been approaching it. But it is possible to choose to do it when you're healthy, wealthy, and happy and just choose a wiser path that will result in a more pleasant outcome, probably. Because we just don't know what's going to happen in the future. We proceed as if we do. We think every day is going to be like the days that came before, but they're not. Because one day will be the last. And I have these tattoos on my on my arms that I got at the beginning of this whole adventure. One says, memento mori, which means someday you will die. Remember, you will die. And the other says, vita abundant, which is the live abundantly. So I think I, I'm 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 a I'm not a Pollyanna positive thinking kind of guy. I'm more of a pragmatic optimist. I don't believe the best always happens, but I do believe I have the power to make the best of whatever does. Uh, what's, the difference be, uh, what's the difference between being persuaded and someone telling you what's best for you? Uh, huh. Being persuaded is, I believe, a process we participate in willingly. willingly. We, in fact, the best, most effective persuasion is persuasion. You arrive at the desired conclusion on your own. You believe that you came up with the idea yourself. Uh, the best, the best marketing is marketing that ends up with people coming to seek your company out instead of you having to go out and get them with phone sales or, or people knocking on their door. So persuasion is. I believe communication that results in a decision 
in the best interest of the recipient as well as the sender of the message. Imposing it from the outside, whether that be through manipulative selling or marketing or just being ordered to do something by some authority higher than yourself, we all know what that feels like. It feels like oppression. It feels like slavery or, and, you know, most of us use those words casually and don't really think about the, the reality that there are people that live under those true conditions elsewhere in the world. We in probably most people watching this or listening to this right now, we have so much freedom to change our circumstances, our lives and persuasion is something we do for people, not to them. Manipulation and coercion are things we do to people to get something for ourselves, regardless of whether it's good for the person we're communicating with or not. That's that's how I look at those two opposite ends of the same spectrum. Um, please tell us about the habits you wrote about in the book you plan to adopt and how you came up with those. So um, I... I have all my life been a goal setter. It's only in the recent years that I realized setting a, an arbitrary goal, you know, there, there are people who say, just write your goals down and repeat them every day, stick them on the mirror, say them to yourself in the morning, when you start today, and then you'll achieve the goal. I think that may work for some people, but not for the reason they think. Um, what makes things happen is what we choose to do every day. Um, the the habits came from because I read a book by James Clear called Atomic Habits. He makes this case for improving your habits one day at a time, beginning one percent better every day. And I began to think about okay, what are the outcomes I want? I want a healthy body. It means I need to eat a certain way and do a certain amount of exercise. Instead of setting these gigantic goals, I constructed habits of what I'm going to do each day that get me to the result I want in the future. And these include habits of character, behavior, and conduct. So I, I have a list of habits I'm pursuing each day and a list of a code of conduct, how I'm going to deal with people, how I'm going to react to situations, how I'm going to make ethical decisions. And I, I review those each day because I want to be sure I'm on track. Uh, there's a 12-point code the Bible even promotes. Uh, uh, the points weren't uh, uh, the points weren't you were doing, but how the point wasn't what you were doing, but how did you make that change? Uh, can you provide some examples? The points weren't. Can you repeat the question? Uh, there's a 12 point code in the Bible uh, that uh, even promote promotes uh, things that we should do um, that we should strive for. And um, and you weren't doing some of those. How did you make that change to uh, convert it? Because you were already uh, a religious man already, according to the book. And can you give some examples of the changes you made? Uh, based on this uh, 12 point code that we find in the Bible? Yeah. Um, so, how I made the changes were uh, I looked at my own behavior, uh, like, as a for instance, um, I was for. Uh, a great deal of my adult life, I was kind of a grumpy, irritable guy. And I decided I was going to behave cheerfully toward others. And cheerful means something specific. Words have specific meanings. So it's very important to me uh, that I, I adhere to, to the idea that words have specific meanings. Cheerfulness is is you, it's about your demeanor. It's about how you behave. You have a smile on your face. You say pleasant things to people. Um, so I began to 
evaluate um, how I wanted to behave and how I wanted to show up. Another, a better example, let's be more, be more clear. I, I made a decision. One thing I was going to have on my list of habits was I was going to show up, filled up everywhere I go. Show up, filled up. That means I always show up ready to give. Um, you, you can't, you can't pour out benefit, help, education, money, whatever, from an empty cup. You can only pour from a cup that is full. It's overflowing. You, you pour out from the overflow. So showing up filled up means for me, I don't go into any situation thinking I want to get something from people. I always want to give. So having that be a habit that I want to adopt and, and produce results in my life based on my own religious or philosophical beliefs. That's one example. And I, I make that change by reminding myself each day about who I choose to be. So on my list of, of aspirations for each day is show up, filled up every, everywhere I go. So that's an example of, and then I evaluate that at the end of each day as well. How did I do following my own code of conduct today? Uh, you wrote trying harder isn't always the answer, but willingness to submit. Why did you choose the word submit, uh, which usually has a religious overtones as submitting to God and or Jesus or whomever? Uh, I chose it for the very reason that makes people a little upset with me for choosing it. Uh, because I believe that whether you, whether you believe in God or not, um, the ability to submit to reality is something a lot of people lack. A lot of people live in denial of what reality is. Like if I eat a certain way, I'll become more or less healthy. If I take certain actions with my money, if I spend less than I earn and I save the difference and invest it, I'll become wealthier than if I don't. Um, we... We, when we submit to what is in front of us, we're acknowledging this is how things are. So I, I, I strive very, it's very important to me to work hard at facing things as they are, not worse than they are, not better than they are. So you start life change by first acknowledging this is how things are. You have an accurate view of reality. Then I imagine how I want them to be, what they'd look like if they were better than they are. Then I go to work at making them like I saw them when I saw them better than they are. I don't delude myself, but I don't stop and just get into a state of learned helplessness when I face something I don't like. So that's submitting to reality or submitting to the will of God or submitting to fate, whatever you believe. I'm not here to tell anybody what to believe, but I'll say this. The act of submission to what is. Byron Katie says, when you try to pick an argument with reality, reality only wins 100% of the time. Why did you believe your illness was your fault? Uh, what was the logic behind that? And why did you think others felt the same? I um I think I can I can I can't speak for other people, but I, I think that I felt I had not uh, taken as good a care of my physical self as I could have uh, when I was young. I indulged in certain behaviors that involved intoxicants, like I smoked weed and I drank alcohol, and uh, I I I found myself asking, well. I wonder if I hadn't done those things, would I have this condition? Because there's a, there's a saying in the health world that genetics loads the gun, but you pull the trigger. Um, so that means how you eat, how you behave, how you think, your attitude and approach to life have a lot to do with the expression of certain genes. So um, I, I'm, I'm not as hard on myself now as I once was about that. 
because what is, is I, I have the disease and I have actions I can take now to help mitigate the symptoms and to feel better, to perform better. I had brain surgery a little over a year ago, had a deep brain stimulation procedure done that rolled the clock back like five to seven years on the Parkinson's disease. It's been a, a wonderful gift in my life. But it's only through the ability to examine, you know, what role have I played in where I am now and what role can I play going forward that has allowed me to make decisions like that for the better. Uh, you write bad things can ha have positive outcomes. Give us an example. Well, okay, I think we've all we've all probably had an experience like this, but in uh, 1995, I moved my entire family to Salt Lake City, Utah, for a job in the radio broadcasting business, and it was the biggest job I ever had. It was six figure salary. I was on a morning show there for six months, and then I got fired. And it was the first and only time I've ever been fired in my life. And it wasn't even my fault. They they had uh, been in contract negotiations with another radio personality. And it doesn't matter. The point is, I was there for another six months before I had a job. And um, on the one hand, it was terrible at the time. Because it's like, oh, my God, I don't have a job. I've been fired. I moved my family across country. I'm living in this town with people who have a different religion than mine. It feels kind of weird here to me. And, uh, but because of that bad thing happening, I had months with my family. We went to Arches National Park. We went to Moab. We went to all these beautiful natural sites and camped and hiked and had time together. Like I, it never would have happened. I never would have slowed down enough. I had had that quote bad thing happen to me, and uh, it was it was one of my one of the most treasured memories me and my family have is the months we spent there together, and then we ended up coming to Spokane, Washington as a result of that, where we live now. We've lived here for the last twenty six years. We love it here. Wouldn't be here if that hadn't happened. That's an example of how bad things, supposedly bad things, happen that turn out to be really good. Um, please tell us your philosophy, which you write about uh, regarding handling fear. Um, I'm not even sure I remember what I wrote about handling fear. Um, I, uh, I, so I'm just going to give you the answer I had. It comes to me in this moment. And that is how do I handle fear now? Um, the first thing I ask is myself is why am I afraid? Is it, is it valid? Is this fear valid? Is it, uh, is there a reason to be afraid? And if yes, then what should I do? How do I evaluate that? And if no, then um, I do my best to accumulate the evidence that helps me believe in fact I should not be afraid. And then I, move forward. Facing fear is the answer to, to fear. That's kind of like Franklin Roosevelt saying, right? We only have fear. We only fear fear to fear itself. Yes. Yes. I mean, you know, there's, there's a reason. There's a natural biological reason for fear. Um, but fear should be a temporary state. It's like I'm, I'm being attacked. What should I do? I should fight or run or freeze. That's that's a that's a good reaction to have in your arsenal. Continuous fear, like so many people have today, is bad for us. We call it stress, uh, and I think it's fed mainly by social media and the distractibility of modern society. So I think the more we can do to be focused and present where we are, I really, I. I know I, you know, I, I feel like sometimes the younger people around me get annoyed because they think I'm just being an old man saying, put down your phone, get off social media. But 
there's lots of evidence that shows us that, that those devices are causing us to live in a state of heightened fear, anxiety, cortisol imbalance, uh, and it's doing damage to our ability to pay attention and focus on the work at hand and to be able to, to accurately parse what's really happening in front of us. We, we, we get so involved in our online life, we think it's our real life, and it's not even close. So, so it's funny you should say that now because we had a question from the audience, which is basically what you've been talking about just now about digital devices. Uh, what's the front of us and what is happening? Uh, what advice do you have for parents with teenagers with what is happening? Um, my advice to parents with teenagers is separate them from those devices. Uh, at least, at the very least, I mean, you can't stop them. They're good. They're going to have the devices. Um, the only way you can stop them is lock them in a room and keep them there. That won't work. That, that does not work out well. You don't want to end up being an episode of 2020. Um, so I would say at least enforce the rule at dinner, at, at lunch, in the house, when we're having time together as a family. You will put down your device and you will not look at it. You will pay attention to the conversation and the events that are happening in front of you right now. And... Do your best to communicate your worldview to those teenagers in a way they can understand instead of handing down the stone tablets of truth to them, engage them in discussions and respect them as being intelligent. They are, they may, they may not seem like it to you. They're very intelligent, but you have to start with the premise that, that they are and recognize it to have real dialogue with them. Otherwise they're not going to listen. And anybody who's had teenagers knows that there are no absolute answers that always work because in ways they're alien creatures we can't understand. They're a different life form. We barely I, remember what it was like to be one of them. Yeah, th there's that period of time that they are like that. Uh, one of the listeners wants you to repeat again what is uh, the tattoos on your arm? Um, one is memento mori. Uh, so this, That's this the a, other arm. The other yeah. arm has the yeah. that phrase. Yeah. Mental yep. mori means remember you will die. It's a contemplation exercise the Stoics did. It was just to remind them. It's not to be morbid. It's to remind them of their own mortality. That is coming. This is coming to an end. We all know that, but like none of us believe it until often until the day it happens. Um, it's good to contemplate your mortality because it makes you value the life you have, which is what the other tattoo means. You live abundantly. Something I strive to do every day because I, I, there's not a day goes by. I can say this. I can say this with full integrity. There's not a day goes by. That I don't say to myself out loud. The day is a gift. I'm grateful for, the, for this gift. How do you reframe negative experiences for positive outcomes? Well, um, I have a I have a series of questions I ask myself whenever I recognize a negative experience is happening or has happened, and they go something like this: um, What's great about this? And my my brain's answer usually immediately is nothing. This sucks. Um, then the second question is, well, if there could be something great about it, what would that be? Then what can I learn from this? What am I willing to do so this never happens again? What am I willing to not do so this never happens again? How can I use this? If you ask those questions and you actually write down the answers, don't just answer them in your head or it won't do any good. It'll do very little good. If you write down the answers and you're very emotionally connected to the answers that you write and you, after you write them out, you read them out loud. If you go through that exercise, I think you'll find there's very few negative experiences you cannot reframe in the moment by just going through those questions, writing them down and reading back your answers out loud. It changes the way you feel about it, which is what we're really looking for. 
Here's the next question from the audience. Bad things, events you speak to that can bring good things uh, in your life. Are these trauma, small and big? And if so, do you ascribe to post-traumatic growth in contrast to post-traumatic stress disorder? What can you advise a person uh, does to be uh, to be uh, prepared for and able to turn a trauma into a growth? Wow, what a great question! I I do I do in fact uh, believe that post traumatic growth syndrome is a great model that I, I use every day. I I want to be clear though, there is such a thing as post traumatic stress syndrome. That's disorder. That is true, but I think it's less it it's less common than we believe. Um, so I don't want to minimize anyone's struggle they may have with PTSD. It's a real thing. I, my dad served two terms in Vietnam, and I've seen the effects of PTSD firsthand. I, I know how devastating that can be. But I think that most people who, you know, people who say things like, I had an argument with my boss and I have PTSD. Oh, come on. I mean, I I hate to be dismissive about how, tough that conversation was for you, but I think maybe reframing it as it was traumatic in a way is you can grow from the experience because you can learn from it. You can use questions like the ones I was asking earlier to transmute your experience into some, something you can grow from. I think most of the time, the post-traumatic growth path is the better path to choose and we can choose. And there's a, there's another great book out there by Scott Adams, of all people. Yes, the guy who invented Dilbert. It's called Reframe Your Brain. And it's a whole book about reframing experiences by just using different words to describe them. I, I like that you're such a reader yourself, Ray, that you keep quoting other people's books. And now everybody's thinking, oh, I had to get that book. I had to get that book, too. So uh, I think that's great. Another question from the audience. If we can ask a writing question, can I ask if there's any book, podcast, YouTube, talk, course, you can recommend to write more interesting copies for your parents? Yes. Um, books. A couple of books I'll recommend. One is by Anne Lamott. It's called Bird by Bird. Great book on writing. Um, another book is by William Zinzer um, on writing. Well, is the title of that book. Uh, I I always mention Stephen King's book on writing, which I think is a, a great writing book as well. Um, and then I would recommend a book by Stephen Pressfield called The War of Art. Not The Art of War. That's by Sun Tzu. It's also good, but it's not doesn't help you with writing very much. The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield is a great book on writing. Why is pain a better motivator than pleasure? Well, um, I'm not a neuroscientist, but like... Most people these days, I play one on the internet. Um, <laughs> I I think um, there's lots of evidence to support the theory that we are more motivated by pain than we are by pleasure to act. So we will do more to get out of pain, in other words, than we will to get into pleasure. Because the pain we feel in the moment is more real than the possible pleasure we might feel in the future. So we're just, we're just hardwired that way. It's why we, we don't have to think about taking our hand off the hot coil on the stove. We accidentally touch it. We, it happens automatically. Our bodies are wired to move us out of pain. So it doesn't mean that pleasure, the promise of pleasure, doesn't help motivate us to do things. I think it's best if we can bring both things into, into play. What's the pain I'm going to experience if I don't make a change? And what's the pleasure I can gain if I do make the change? Having answers to both those questions, I believe is what motivates true change most effectively. Um, 
When, what kind of people should you keep in your life and who did you find out should be discarded? I recommend you carefully examine what people you spend most of your time with, and what kind of influence they have over your attitudes and behavior. And that you, you start by defining what are the states of being, emotional, mental states, and the patterns of behavior you want to develop and continue to get better at in your life. And then examine the people who are in your life and ask, does this person support those values? Do they help me cultivate those values, behaviors, and thoughts? Or do they oppose those values, behaviors, and thoughts? If they do, then I think you want to examine why you're spending so much time with them. So some people will say, well, I, 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 don't, have a, I don't have a choice. This is my family, and they they oppose my values. Well, love your family, but choose your peers who have influence over you. And the ones who support your values, bring them closer. The ones who oppose your values, if you can, just excise them from your life. You don't have to make a big a you don't have, you don't have to make a big announcement about it. You don't have to have a confrontation. You can simply st stop spending so much time with people who oppose what you value. Um, you joined a mastermind group. Uh, please explain what that is and how how did that uh, joining that group make a difference for you? Napoleon Hill, who's the author of a book called Think and Grow Rich, wrote about the, the power of the mastermind. And what he said was when two or more people come together for the purpose of mutual benefit, it's as if a third mind is present that helps guide them and direct them their endeavors. I think it's another way of saying two heads are better than one. So um, I consciously chose to seek out a group of people. Just, there are six of us. I think it's a, kind of an ideal number for a mastermind. Um, and those people, we come together for the purpose of mutual benefit. We have a meeting on a regular basis where we each bring to the meeting our victories, our wins, we start each meeting with those to define the the kind of attitude we want to have going forward in the meeting. Then we each can present a problem or challenge we're facing in our life or in our business, and we get input from the other five members of the group on ways we might solve that problem or behavior or opportunity, for that matter. So it's bringing together the smartest people you can find, the wisest people you can find, not always the same thing, by the way, smart and wise. And we, we get feedback, input, advice, and connections from those people that help us grow, overcome uh, obstacles, problems, and achieve greater heights of success. That's, that's why I'm a member of such a group. I've been a member of the, my, my main mastermind group. I have more than one. My main mastermind group, I've been in the same group with the same people for over 10 years. And it's one of the most valuable things I've ever done. Oh, wow. Um, here's the last question. What does commitment cost and how do you measure and account for it? Wow. Wow. Thanks for saving the easiest question for last. <laughs> Gotta uh, have something challenging. Commitment. I think true commitment can cost everything a true commitment usually costs a lot because why else do we have to be committed to it it doesn't take a lot of commitment for me to eat a donut i don't need practice i don't need a psych up session just find me a donut i can eat it uh, commitment is as a general rule the more valuable the, the behavior or outcome seeing the more difficult the commitment Somebody put it, I think it was Charlie Munger who put it this way. He said, commitment can be illustrated best by breakfast. The chicken is interested. The pig is committed. Yeah, I've heard that saying for a long time. Absolutely.
Ray, thank you so much. You took a horrible, horrible situation and turned it into something that could help people, everybody that you touch, and certainly helps all of us reframe uh, in a positive way the things that we go through uh, to make sure that we just enjoy the moment uh, as we have it, right? At the end of the day, it's all the little things and your friends and family that matter the most. It's never possessions or awards or any of those things. That's right. That's very true. Thank you for the opportunity to share. I really appreciate it. Well, we hope that you'll come out with another book as you keep getting deeper into this and we can have you share that as well. I'd be happy to do that. Everyone have a great rest of your weekend and it was good having you. We'll see you all next Friday.